I can tell you is that this is a great season for our church. Tell your neighbor, this is a great season. Even, even tonight, uh, so many great doors are opening up for us. We're seeing revival in Chula Vista. Chula Vista is on fire. Yeah. I was there on Friday night and packed out. And then even before service tonight, uh, uh, once again, the San Diego PD, they requested to meet with me tonight before service. And they came into my office tonight, uh, Lieutenant Servine, who's become a really great friend, not only of mine, but of the Ministry of Victor Ice here in San Diego. And he invited me, he, he says, the chief of police wants to meet with you, Pastor Al. He wants to have a personal meeting with you. And I said, man, you know, I remember when I used to run from the cops. I remember I'd be driving and they'd pull up behind me and I'd get real nervous. Come on, you start stashing stuff in the ashtray. Come on, somebody, put stuff under your seat. Who remembers that? Some of you still do that, amen. And uh, I said, what for? I said, what do you want to meet with me for? You know, why me? Amen. What did I do? And they said, no, listen, Pastor, you, you need to understand the urgency of the times we are here. You know, this has been one of, and this is not something to get excited about. This is something to really pray about, that this has been one of the deadliest uh, summers in the southeast. And um, you probably know that. Many of you know that there have been more shootings and just more more things happening to people. The, the neighborhoods right now are really rising up against each other, uh, all the neighborhoods. And even the Brown Berets are rising up. And there's a big uprising right now in the Southeast. The black neighborhoods are rising up. The Bloods, the Crips, everybody is, as they say in the world, everyone's on one right now. And, and, and they're shooting at each other. Lives are being taken. Young people are dying in the streets. In the 16 years that I have been here in San Diego, this has for sure been the deadliest summer that I've ever experienced. And even uh, uh, Ernesto today confirmed that. He said it's one of the deadliest summers we've had. But we need victory outreach. We need victory outreach. We need victory outreach to rise up. We need we need you, Pastor Al. We need Pastor Chris, Pastor Miller, the, the ministers to rise up. And they said we need an answer we need an answer so we spent this afternoon discussing some ideas of, of what we can do to be able to meet this need I told him listen if we're gonna meet this need it can't just be this year we've got to have a three five year plan we've got to really begin to be committed to stopping the violence and bringing peace to the southeast and he goes I'm behind you all the way you know if there was ever a time for Victor to rise up it's now there's a lot of changes in our city. Uh, there's going to be an election for the mayor. There's going to be an election for, these, for city council people. You know, guys, California is not the most, it's not the best state in the union. It's very liberal. But how many know that we have the answer? We have the answer to drug addiction. We have the answer to gang violence. We have the answer for the guys and the girls coming out of the joint. Come on, somebody. How many believe we have the answer? And, and, and they, they said to me, they said, Pastor Al, we can't do it without Victor Outreach, so we step up. And I said, listen, that's our dream. <laughs> this is why we're here. We're not here just to have church. We're here to bring change wherever we go and so keep me in prayer we'll be meeting with chief neslet on thursday i imagine it'll be one of many meetings uh, they've asked me to pull all the pastors in not just victor h pastors all of the pastors in from san diego especially in the southeast how can we work together to bring peace to san diego and so i'm going to need your prayers i you know we're getting into territory that is new territory for us but how many know wherever God guides, he provides? And wherever God takes us, he shows us the way. Can I hear an amen? So you're a part of a church that is not an ordinary church. If you're new tonight, I want you to know that you're part of a church that's not ordinary. Tell your neighbor, we're not ordinary. There's a special anointing, a special calling. And even tonight, I want you to know that um, that's why this message I feel is important. God gave me this message for tonight. And that's why we need to rise up. But we also need to continue to change. Continue 
to change. Look at your neighbor and tell him, let's continue to change. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Samuel. Thank you, guys. Chapter 17. And if we could all stand for the reading of the word tonight, we respect the word of God, respect the preacher. 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you could turn with me to verse 25. And tonight I want to talk to you on the subject of defeating the giant of change. Defeating the giant of change. First Samuel chapter 17 in verse 25, it reads like this. It says, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and his father's house, exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? What will be done for him? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine or this giant that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, go down here to uh, verse 29. And we find that David is being uh, questioned about his motives. How many know that there are always some people who are questioning our motives? And David says, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Tell your neighbor there's a cause. And then in verse 33, go there with me. And Saul, King Saul, said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are only a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But look what David said to Saul. He said, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or bear came up and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from his mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. He says, your servant has killed the lion and the bear. How many of you killed some lions? You killed some bears. Look at this. He says, this Philistine will be like one of them. And moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. Look at this. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul tells him, go and the Lord be with you. The Lord be with you. I want to talk to you for a moment about defeating the giant of change. You, you may be seated tonight. Everyone tonight say this with me, say change. change. In the book of Romans chapter 12, there's a very familiar portion of scripture that Paul writes to the Romans. He says this, he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I want to talk to you about defeating the giant of change. And in this Christian life, we know that it's not just about one radical change. We all had a radical change on that day we fully surrendered our life to Jesus, didn't we? Many of us can still remember the rumblings of our friends and family when they realized that we had accepted Jesus. Who remembers that? And you can remember what many people begin to say about us. They said, he's changed. She's changed. Come on, somebody. They don't, they don't drink no more. They don't get high no more. They don't, they don't even cuss no more. Well, some of you may still cuss, but come on, somebody. <laughs> How many know we're changing? <laughs> and it really did kind of cause a stir. And some people were happy about it. Some people were actually even sad about it. They lost their drinking buddy. They lost their club, club buddy. Come on, somebody. You couldn't do the hoochie mama thing no more, amen? <laughs> Some guys are raising their hand. Why? Amen. amen. <laughs> but it really was true. We changed. Amen. Who could say amen? amen? My testimony, you know, when I got saved, people were shocked. I think there were a lot of people. In fact, I know that there are a lot of people that said, Al will never change. He will never change. He just won't change. 
and uh, he's just too much in the world. He's too much out there. He's too resistant to the things of God. But how many know God is powerful? And God did change my life. In fact, when, when I got changed, there was actually kind of like during a time in our church where there was like a revival, a revival in my generation with my group of friends. I remember Georgina got saved first, and then later I got saved, and then uh, my brother Tim got saved, and all of us started experiencing revival. I think when I got change it really set a fire because people probably started to think that Jesus was coming back I mean people really were shocked like if, if Al can change how many know we better get right with God so during that time we had radical changes in our life How, however what I think every one of us knows or should know is that change is not a one-time event it's not a one-time event how many know that to walk with Jesus is to live a life of constant change I think that's so important. I, I don't even know, even if you're serving God for 20 years, how many know he changes us every day? No matter how long you've been serving God, it, it's one radical change after another. And I think that's so important, especially for Christians tonight that find themselves stuck or find themselves caught up or find themselves in a season uh, maybe even in a bad season of your life, I came to tell you the only cure is change. The only cure is change. Another word for change, we read about it in the book of Romans, is the word transform or transformation. And in the book of Romans, Paul commands us to, to be transformed, to be transformed, to change. That's a word that I'm going to talk about tonight is, is that word change, transformation, the, the, the Paul says you got to constantly be changing, constantly be transforming. The word transform in the in the in the Webster's is to make a thorough or dramatic change in form, appearance, or character. So to be transformed is to make a dramatic change. That if we're changing, our change should constantly be moving, constantly be dramatic. Now there are three things I want to share with you about change. Number one, write this down: change is good. Who could? Who could agree with me on that? That's why you're here tonight, isn't it? Aren't you here because you want God to change you? Isn't that why you started coming to church? Because you wanted God to change you? Well, let me just say that change is good. Let me say this. Change is God. In fact, God loves change. In fact, God loves change so much, he built change into this world we live in. You ever heard of seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall? All that represents change. So God made change the default setting of this life. Someone said that if we do not create change in our life, then change will create us. So I came to tell you tonight that we're not supposed to be conformed to the system of this world. If you're a believer, if you've been washed in the blood, if you are a Christ follower, we cannot conform to this world. We're not called to conform to this world we live in. We're not called, we're not supposed to settle for the world's system and for the world's offerings. If you're in a bad season, I came to tell you, you're not supposed to settle in that bad season. We're not supposed to be satisfied with what the world has to offer. We're not called to conform. Watch this. We are called to transform. And if we're going to transform our surroundings around us, we have to first let God transform what's inside of us. So change is good. Say change is good. Also, change is not easy. Change is not easy. Who, who could say amen? Just give me that old two snaps of amen, preacher. Change is not easy. You know why change is not easy? Because pe some people, they don't like change. They don't like change. Some people have a tendency to resist change. Whenever you hear the word change, some of you, even when I talked about change, and I, I feel a lot of you leaning in, but maybe a few just kind of pull back because we don't like change. Some people are also very slow to change, very slow to change. It, it seems like they're late on the blessing, late on the breakthrough, late on the Miracle. Come on, somebody. Why? Because they resist change. But here's what I want you to know. If you don't want to change or you don't see a need to change, then you'll never change. 
I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty simple, isn't it? And, you know, in, in reality, some people do, do think that way. They don't see a need to change. They don't feel an urge to change, they, and, and therefore they never change. And, and another thing is that if you b don't believe you can ever change, your life will stay the same. I think if there was anything I wanted to say through this message tonight is that God has more for you. God has more for you. Who, who can agree with that tonight? He has more for you. But in order for you to step into what God has, you have got to accept the concept of change. Or else your life will stay the same. See, so many people just accept their situation. They just accept it. They just accept it. They just say, it, it, this is the way it is. This is the way it's going to be. This is the way my marriage is going to be. This is the way my kids are going to be. This is the way the environment in my home is going to be. This is the way my health is going to be. This is the way my money is going to be. This is where I'm going to be in the church. I'm never going to go any higher. I'm never going to do anything. Why? Because they refuse to change. And if you're going to step into what God has for you, you're going to have to come against those situations that rise up in your life to try to stop you from changing. That tell you you can't change. That tell you that life can't get better. That tell you you can't be healed. That tell you you can't be blessed. That tell you that your marriage can't break through. That your family can't break through. You're, you're going to have to have the spirit of David in your life. In the, in the scripture that I read, we find that David, he wasn't even the king yet. But David refused to accept the situation facing his people. That's where change begins. When a person says that this giant must go down. This giant must go down. I refuse to accept the fact that this giant is going to stay in my path. It's when somebody begins to rise up and says what David says to his brother when his brother was criticizing him. He said, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to take this giant out? Is there not a reason to remove the reproach from Israel? I came to tell you that being stuck brings a reproach against God's people. I came to tell you that fear brings a reproach against God's people. I came to tell you that staying stuck in a season is not a good sign on you. Being stuck in a sickness, being stuck in a financial situation, staying stuck in a bad marriage, staying stuck in a bad relationship, staying stuck in whatever you're staying stuck in is not a good look. David saw that giant pumping fear into God's people, and he said to himself, it's not a good look. We are not those people of fear. We are the people of God. We are a people of power. The giant has got to come down. Is there anyone here tonight that say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of quivering in fear. And the giant has got to come down. It takes that kind of spirit. There's something powerful about living in God-inspired change. Change inspired by God makes your life exciting. It takes your life into breakthrough. It takes you from level to level to level. And that's the third thing about change. Are you getting something so far tonight? Is that change is necessary. Tell your neighbor change is necessary. It's necessary. If your life's going to change, if your season's going to change, if your situation's going to get better, Something has to change in you. Change is necessary and change is possible. Change gets us from where we are to where God wants us to be. If anybody wants to go into a new season of their life, they must all enter through the door of change. They must go through the same door. We all got to go through the same door. There are no shortcuts. There are no alternative pathways. I don't care if you have the Waze app on your phone. There's only one way. And that's through the door of change. Woo, come on. I'm putting a message in someone's mouth tonight because when you go home, you're going to look at those kids. You're going to say, it's time to change. You're going to look at that spouse and say, it's time to change. Come on, somebody. There's only one way to the next season, and that's through change. It's possible to change, though. And in order for it to become possible, you have to stop believing the lie that you can't change. 
You have to stop believing the contrary voices that tell you that there is nothing better for you. You have to stop believing the lies of unsafe family members and unsafe co-workers and doubters in your life. Who, who has doubters? Wave at me. You got some doubters in your life. You know, the doubters are always the ones that can't get happy with you when you're winning. Come on, somebody. You'll get so good at this stuff that you'll just stop talking to those people. Change is possible, but you've got to believe the right voice. You've got to, you've got to believe that God is able. You have to believe that change is possible, that life can get better. When David went to the battlefield, his brother said, what are you doing here? Why are you here? What is your motive? Why are you getting involved in this thing? He had doubters. He had critics. He had people that tried to stop him. I came to tell you, every single one of us has someone in our life that tries to stop us from being great for God. Every one of us has, they, prayerfully, you don't live with them. But if you live with them, don't believe the lie. Change is possible for you, and change is possible for them as well. I think a lot of times that we, 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 we don't think change is possible is because we've been believing the lie from a young age. I, I've shared this story before. I want to share it again. I think it's worth sharing it again. You know, many of you have seen that photograph of a horse or a donkey tied to a, a, a flimsy chair with a rope. And you notice that that donkey doesn't move. He just stays in his place. And one day someone came up to the person who owned the donkey and says, how is it that this powerful animal is, is, is attached to this plastic chair with a rope and he doesn't move? He says, well, because from a young age I train him to obey the rope. I train him that this rope represented that he could only go this far and no further. And I came to tell you tonight that if you're going to get into the next season, you've got to cut the rope. You've got to cut the rope. You've got to take off the limits, son. Is there anyone here tonight that says, yes, this is my season? See, we serve a God of transformation. We serve a God of change. He could bring powerful change into your life. But the question is, how do we do it? That's the million dollar question. How do we do it? What are the, what are the giants that we have to slay in order to have powerful change? Well, David gives us the formula here. The most famous giant slayer in the Bible is David. And this encounter with Goliath certainly changed David's life forever. That, that's the point I don't want you to miss, is that it changed his life forever. Tell your it changed his life forever. It changed the history of his life. It changed the history of his life. David became Israel's most famous king outside of Jesus Christ. And, and taking down this giant was David's catalyst for change. This was the catalyst. This was the, the fuse that lit the bomb. And that giant that's standing in front of you, when that giant falls, your life is not going to be the same. When that giant falls, your life is not going to be the life that you once knew. God's going to take you to a whole new level. So in 1 Samuel 17, he teaches three things about creating change in our life. Number one, write this down. David knew the source for change. That's the first thing. If you want to change... You have to know and be confident in your source for change. Okay, and I want to talk to some of you people who are new tonight. You need to know your source and be confident in your source. What makes this different than a motivational speech? I talk to people all the time. They come to church and they say, oh, pastor, that was a good talk. You ever heard someone? That? What a great talk. Well, first of all, I don't, I don't talk. I yell. So I don't know how that was a talk. I'm a yeller. <laughs> I pretty much yell most of the time. But he said, that was a great talk. That tells me that they look at it as a motivational speech. And how many know that this is not a motivational speech? And I'll tell you why. The reason this is not a motivational speech, because this thing I'm saying is attached to a person. Yeah. 
This thing that I'm telling you is attached to a source. I was just a man who was starving that found the bakery, and I'm telling you where to find it for yourself. Come on, who caught that right now? See, David could defeat Goliath because he knew the source for himself, and he was confident in the source for himself. See, this is not motivation. This is not inspiration. This is something called relationship. And I want to tell you, if you want to experience real change in your life, you've got to come into relationship. You've got to tap in to the source for yourself. Who is the source? The source is God. The source is Jesus. The source is the power of the Holy Ghost. Does anyone believe in the source tonight? See, David was attached to the source of change. He knew his source. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, once again, he was questioned about how he was going to defeat the, 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 the giant. How are you going to do it, David? How are you going to take the giant down? How are you going to fulfill this promise? How are you going to step up? How are you going to get the job done? Even the king says, how, how can you do it? You're just a young boy, and he's been a warrior from a young age, and who are you, and how are you going to do it? But David had a source. And when he stepped up to the king, he said, listen, I used to take care of my father's sheep. And you know what he was doing when he was in the shepherd field? He was singing to the Lord. He was writing songs to the Lord. He was praying. He was worshiping. Are there any worshipers in this place that love their Jesus and love their God? And he was worshiping the Lord. And he says, and when the lion and the bear came, he says, it was the Lord that gave me the power to take down the lion and to take down the bear. So the source that gave me the power to defeat those two creatures is the same source that's going to give me the power to take this giant down. Is anyone catching this word here tonight? The God that delivered me from the lion, the God that delivered me from the bear, the God that has kept me in the hospital bed, the God that has kept me in my down seat. Jesus, the God that has always been with me wherever I go. Guess what? He's the same God that gives me the power to take down the giant that stands in front of me right now. Thank God that no, even though David had doubters and critics, he knew his source. You're going to have doubters. You're going to have critics. You're going to have people that come against you. You're going to have people that try to fear you in the wrong direction but when you know your source none of those things can move you tonight none of those things can move you he says the God who delivered me will deliver me again so David knew his source for change the second thing is this is that David had the motivation for change this is the part that's heavy he had the motivation for change this is the this is the part tonight where you might not clap as much, but I've learned that anyone that wants to change must have the motivation to change. And, and often I've learned this, is that God uses the negative experiences in your life to bring powerful transformation in your life. We despise negative situations. We, des we despise negative experiences, but God actually takes those negative experiences and he utilizes them to bring powerful change in you. Israel had a giant, and it took a young man who could recognize that that giant had caused his countrymen to stall out in fear. And it, and it took a young man connected to a source to be willing to step up and face that negative experience head on. And this is where the rubber meets the road, everybody. See, there's something in your life right now that God wants to use to be powerful motivation for your change. It doesn't feel good. It hurts. It's hard. It's difficult. It pokes you. It prods you. It mocks you. It yells at you. It stands in your way. It, it's like a dark cloud over you, but God wants to take that thing and use it to motivate you. It's called something called pain. 
And pain creates a particular desperation in a man or a woman. Pain is what gives us the desire to change. Hear me and hear me clear. It's pain that brings change. Someone said the pain of staying the way you are. The pain of a situation that will not change. Someone said when the pain of staying the way you are becomes stronger than of the pain of making the change, that's when you will change. Should I say it again? When the pain of staying the way you are becomes greater than the sacrifices you have to make to change, that's when change can take place. Some people don't change because they're not tired yet. But how many remember what it felt like to be so tired that you knew something had to change? And that's when you got saved. But I came to tell you, even though you've been serving the Lord for five years, 10 years, 15 years, some even longer than that, you still have to listen to that pain. You still have to be obedient to that pain. You still have to recognize that when that pain shows up in your life, it's God saying, guess what? It's time to change. Someone once said that. One preacher said, God whispers in our times of victory, but he shouts in our times of pain. He's using that pain to get your attention. He's using that pain to tell you, listen, I got something more for you. He's using that chain. He's using that pain in your life to tell you, listen, it's time for you to close this chapter and get to the next chapter. It's time to close this chapter. I haven't called you to dwell in that chapter. I haven't called you to live in that chapter your whole life. We've done read it. We've done been through it. There's notes all over it. It's time to close it. It's time to change the chapter. It's time to go to the next level. It's time to go into the new thing. And you've got to be unapologetic about it. See, there are reasons we should change. Desperation and pain is one of them. Here's another motivation for change. Missed opportunities. Missed opportunities. Missed experiences. Things that you are missing out on because you won't change. Things that you're not able to experience and really have joy in. Because you won't change. Moments. Valuable moments of your life. Everyone else is rejoicing. Everyone else is happy. Everyone else is blessed. But you can't get blessed. Why? Because you won't change. You want to stay in the old chapter. And this is real talk here tonight. Some young people may not fully understand it, but I know many of you do. We miss out because we don't change. We miss out on goals. We miss out on opportunities. We, we miss out on particular personal passions in our life because we are afraid of change. Godly experiences that other people are having because they're making the changes, because they're flexible for God, because they're saying, God, listen, my life is not my own. And you know what? You've never led me astray, and you've always taken care of me. And I mean, I understand what you're doing in my life, but I'm going to follow you wherever you lead me. And every time God leads you, he leads you into a good experience. He leads you into a blessing. He leads you into something that brings joy within your life. But so many people miss it because they want to stay stuck in an old season. They don't want to make the change. I got to tell you, man, this is a personal point for me. Because I've seen my fair share of hard times. I've seen my fair share of conflict. I've seen my fair share of, of trials and fiery seasons and, 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 and divisions and, you know, backstabbings. And come on, somebody, anyone out there? I've, I've seen those things in my life. And when I turned 43, I could tell you when I turned 43, <laughs> I had an epiphany. Who's ever had an epiphany? Some of you are Googling, what's epiphany? <laughs> Just put it this way, the light bulb turned on. Bing! When I turned 43 years old, I had an epiphany. My, my light bulb turned on. 
I had that moment. And you know what I said to myself? I said, this is the time for me. You said, that sounds selfish. Maybe that's because you haven't been through nothing yet. 43 years old, I woke up one day. I said, this is the time for me. I paid my dues. I paid my dues. I paid the price in ministry. I paid the price with people. I've suffered loss. I've been through battles. And you know what? Now is the time where I'm in my prime. I'm in my prime. Shoot. Come on, somebody. Now, if you're 20 years old, stay humble now. But let me talk to my 40-somethings in the house. I woke up one morning. I said, I've been through my fair share of trials. I've been through my battles, but I'm in my prime. This is my season. It's time for me to experience the blessings of God in my... I, I, I said, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. If I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. If, if I don't... If I, if, I stop, if I don't stop making excuses, and if I stop, don't stop saying it's not the right time, or I've got too many problems, or I've got too many things going on, or I've got too many kids, or I've got too many, come on somebody. I've got too many bills, or I've got too many things going on. It's never going to get done. I said, if I'm going to do anything for God, I'm going to do it right now, I'm going to do it right here, and I'm not going to apologize to anybody about it. Come on, I'm trying to put a resolve in you. Because we need motivation to change. I, I said to myself, I said, man, God has put some things on my heart to do. How many ever had God put some things on your heart to do? God put some things on my heart to do. God gave me some visions when I was a young man. God gave me some ideas when I was a young man, just young in the Lord. And I would sit in these services, and I would sit under the preaching, and I would be faithful, and I would go to the altar, and I would go to the crusades, and I would go to the early morning prayer meetings, and I would go to all night prayer, and I would pray with the home, and I would serve God. And God spoke to me about some things, and I refused to believe that if God gave me a vision, that God wasn't going to bring that vision to pass at some point. Is this helping anybody to, you need motivation. I, I had that light bulb turn on. I said, whatever I'm going to do, I got to do it now. And you know what? If, if some people don't like it, too bad. If Eliab don't like it, too bad. And, and I realized that a lot of times I wasn't doing things because some people didn't like it. Well, who do you think you are? Don't you know that there's a need over here? And you know what? Shut up. I don't want to hear it. This is my time. I paid my dues. I'm going into a new season. I'm not staying stuck in the past. I'm ready to experience the fullness of God's blessing in my life. Is there anyone here that can say amen? Anyone here that can say yes, God? I'm getting motivated right now to change. You don't like it, you gotta step aside. If you're mad at me, you gotta step aside. You don't like me being blessed? Drop me on Facebook and Instagram because you're only gonna get madder. No, I'm serious tonight. Because I'm not doing it for myself. I got one life to live. Can I testify? I've got one life to live. You you got one life to live. Tell neighbor, you got one life. You don't get two. You got one life. You're in the home, you got one life. You're in the women's home. You got one life. You don't get two. You don't get two chances. You got one life. If you're in the youth, you got one life. And you've got to be doggedly determined. You've got to recognize that there's a calling of God on your life. And you've got to wake up tonight. And you've got to say, I'm not going to apologize for doing God's will. I'm not going to apologize for serving God. i got one life to live. And when I stand before God, I'm not going to stand with my family. I'm going to stand all by myself. I pray my family is obedient. When I get there, I ain't going to be looking for them. Can I talk about it? I pray my family is obedient, but when I get there on that day, it ain't going to be about them. I'm not even quite sure I'm going to know them. It's going to be me and Jesus. 
at him and say, what did you do for me? How did you live for me? Were you willing to change? Oh, my God. That'll change how you do things right now, won't it? That'll change how you do things right now. And then he's going to take all that work. He's going to test it with the fire. See, we don't want to miss any more opportunities. That was strong, wasn't it? Who can give God praise for that point right there? I just feel that was strong. I love my family, but don't get me wrong. I love my family, but my family knows I got to do what God has called me to do. And they got to do it too. And then the third motivation for change is not only missed opportunities, but things that you get to leave behind. Dysfunctional things. Dysfunctional relationships. Financial failure hurts from your past. Health issues. When you make some powerful, positive changes in your life, you can be sure that you're going to leave some stuff back that you're not going to have to deal with any longer. And what God says to you is this, and I'm going to get ready to bring it in. God says to you that I want to bless you. I want to bless you. Tell your neighbor, he wants to bless you. So I hear that all the time, but do you really understand it? Do you really understand that, that, watch this, that there's a reward for change. That giant stood right in front of Israel. David said, the giant's got to go down, but you caught it already. But what are they going to do for the man that takes the giant out? We skim over that. You say, oh, that's selfish. No, it's not. David said, well, what are they going to do for the man? They're going to give him, well, they're going to give him great riches. Number two, they're going to get the king's daughter. Hopefully she's pretty. <laughs> and then no taxes. <laughs> some of you are like, hey, some of you are like, wait, I need that. Hey, come on, somebody. All right, pay your taxes. Come on, somebody. But. He said, what are they going to do for the man that takes the reproach away, that changes the identity? What are they going to do for the man that takes the spirit of defeat away and brings in the spirit of victory? What are they going to do for the man or the woman that, and he says, oh, there's some rewards. Tell your neighbor, there's rewards. <laughs> See, what motivated David were two things. Number one was the cause. He, he looked at his brothers. He says, understand, there's a cause. There's a reason that we're here. And I want to tell you this, your life, don't miss this. Your life is only as powerful as the cause you attach it to. We attach ourselves to so many causes that bring us nothing. And I think tonight some of you are going to be like, get the scissors out. I'm not attached to that cause any longer. Your life is only as powerful as the cause you attach it to. And then secondly, David recognized that there was a reward for taking the giant out. There was a reward, a passion for the reward, a passion to step into the blessing. What will be done for the man? Great riches, the king's daughter, tax exemption. Listen, godly change brings a, resort, a reward. Let, let me tell you this, your life will be better off when you change. Your life will be better off when you change for God. When you change for God, you're going to feel better. You're going you're gonna to look better. That's true. Because some of you, when you came out of God, you were not that great looking. But ever since you've been serving God, man, you look a lot better. You got more of a better thing going. Something happened to your face look better. Some of you are saying amen. It's true. You know why? I think because when you weren't saved, you didn't care, but now you care. You're going to feel better. You're going to look better. You're going to think clearer. 
You're going to be more, more driven. You're going to be more sharp in all that you do. It's like when you lose weight. I've lost some weight recently, and I tell you, I feel great. How many know that's a change? And there's sacrifice involved in losing weight. And when you get hungry at night, you know, you got to eat peanuts and things like that. And it's not cool. You want to eat something bigger. Like a slice of pizza. Come on, somebody. Or a burrito. Talk to me. And you're like, I can't. I got to deny this flesh. I got to change. Come on. The doctor said I got to lose 20 pounds. I got to be obedient. But what, now I feel good. I sleep better. I feel better. My self-esteem is better. My mind is sharper. My energy is better. I'm not negative. I'm not depressed. I'm not under anxiety. I have the victory. I have joy. I want to be around people. Come on. Change has a benefit. And I want to close with this, is that there's nothing wrong with wanting a reward for change. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong to be rewarded for change because that's called the blessing of God. All throughout the scripture, even if you read Deuteronomy, the Lord said, if you are obedient, I will bless you. If you change, I'll bless you. If you do what I tell you, I'll bless you. If you walk the way you, I tell you to walk, I'll bless you. If you hang out with these people, I'll bless you. If you eat these things, I'll bless you. If you do what I tell you, I will bless you. So there's nothing wrong with wanting to be blessed when you have been obedient to the voice of God. Come on, somebody clap. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be blessed. There's nothing wrong with being blessed when you've been obedient to God. And the, and the final thing is they come to the keyboard to get something tonight. Me feel like this message was for you. I feel like any level, come on, any level could receive this tonight. And then the final thing is that David embraced change. He embraced it. I want to I want you to know something that you, you're serving under a pastor that embraces change. Embraces change. I, I feel that. I have to change. I have to always change. I have to keep changing. One day, you never know, man. My hair might be purple. No, I'm just kidding. It's not going to be purple. I'm not going to do anything like that. But <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do that. That's not something I want to do. But the point I'm making is that I'm open to change if God says change. Because I recognize that he's a God of change. And if God wants more, I'm going to give it. I've never been hurt by God when I haven't held back. I, I've never been let down by God when I haven't held back. I've never been let down by God. God has never failed me when I've given him my all. God said, give me this. I gave it to him. He blessed me. God said, give me this house. I gave him the house. He blessed me. God said, give me this calling. I gave him that. He blessed me. God said, give me this thing. And I've just given him. And I've given, whenever he's asked me for something, I've just given it to him. And every time I've done it, he's blessed me and I've been happier for him. Come on, who could, who could testify? Who could clap for the Lord? Say, yes, me too. And he, and he does ask. Tell your neighbor, he does ask. He won't force you, but he will ask you. And David was willing to do whatever God asked him to do without holding back. But not, every, not everyone in the Bible was obedient. There are examples in Scripture of people who didn't embrace change, didn't embrace what God was asking. Just like tonight, there could be some of you that say, oh, well, you don't understand my situation. Listen, I do understand your situation, but you have to be obedient to God. And there was this young ruler that went to Jesus. He said, what do I need to have eternal life? He says, keep the law and keep the Ten Commandments because I've done that. But Jesus knew what he had stashed in his back pocket. Just like he knows what you're holding. And you think you can, you, look, you may be able to hide it from people, but you cannot hide it from God. And as long as God is trying to get you to give that to him, the person you're hiding it from is going to find out that you're holding it, eventually. 
And he says, if you knew he had a lot of money, a lot of possessions, he says, take all that you have, sell it, and give it to the poor. Now watch. The Bible says he could not do it. It's not that he could not do it, it's that he would not do it. And then the Bible says he walked away. Watch. He walked away sad. Sad. When, when you hold back from change, you will be sad. It is in the Bible. When God is saying, change, give me that thing. Enough is enough. The giant must go down. And when you hold back, you, you will be sad. You will be sad. Think of the things in your life that you hold back. You hold back love from your spouse. You hold back love from your children. You hold back money. You hold things back. And what happens is there's no joy in you. You're sad. You're sad because you know you have been holding back in an area where God is telling you to release. Where he's saying, I want to bring change in your life. I've got so much more. And what we need tonight is if the giant is going to go down, we need to know our source. We need to have motivation. But thirdly, we must embrace that change. We must not hold back any longer. I want you to stand with me tonight. With every head bowed and every eye closed tonight, I, I believe there are people here that this message was specifically for you. God doesn't give me messages like this all the time. But you're at a point in your life where you say, I feel God is calling me to change. And this is for every level. This altar call is going to be filled with people from every level, newcomers to veteran believers, where God is saying, I want you to change. I want the giant to go down once and for all. But you have to make a choice. You have to determine in your heart that this is my time, this is my moment. There are benefits. I'm going to step into those benefits. Tonight, if that's you, unapologetically, unashamedly, when you come to this altar tonight, and I want you to begin to lay it all down before the Lord. And I want you to begin to recognize that God wants to take you into a new dimension. Into a new level. And you've got to be doggedly determined. You have to be so tired of the pain and so tired of the frustration. You have to be at that place in your life where you recognize that I've got one life to live and I'm going to live for God the best that I can. I'm going to give my all to Him. And I'm not going to apologize about it. I'm going to give it all. I'm going to lay it all down. I'm going to pour out my life for God and I'm not going to 